Okay, so let me get my screen shared. And hide this. Okay, so um, thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, this is the last one. So tonight is all about equine breeding. So this is just going to be um, more of a really broad overview. It can get really in depth. Um, I've seen several seminars on like just breeding, just like mares, just stallions. So it's a pretty in-depth subject. Um, so if you have questions, by all means, please ask and I'll try to go at least as deep as I can on something. Um, otherwise, I'm going to try to at least hit most of the points um, of, as far as an overview goes. So, but just really quick, like pre-breeding um, for mares and stallions look fairly similar. Um, both are gonna have a breeding soundness exam and for mares, it really is going to look like um, a lameness exam. So just making sure that she's um, physically in shape and lameness can cause a lot of problems, especially if you're trying to do live cover once the stallion starts trying to mount. Um, also her external genitalia, which is an invasive, and then the vet may also choose to do an ultrasound, which is just going to be looking in at her um, internal reproductive tract. So it just depends on how in depth you want to go. It can also depend on the mare's history. If she's had a foal before, what her history with the foal is going to be. Um, and stuff like that is also going to be included in the maybe like the not physical portion of um, breeding soundness when it's, you're not talking about the physical exam when you're going more toward just kind of like the paperwork side of things. Um, you're also going to want to know the mare's history, whether or not she's had a foal, if she's had any problems before, um, things like if she's had cast licks before or during her pregnancy, um, if she has a habit of trying to throw twins, things like that, and then also her age. So a mare, um, obviously only can breed for so long. And it's also important to consider that just because a uh, mare might be sexually mature doesn't always mean that she's ready to breed. Um, so a mare reaches an age where she's coming into heat actually before her um, skeleton is completely fused and formed together. So if you try to breed her too early, depending on the mare, and a lot of it has also has to do with her size, um, you can end up causing damage. So you also want to make sure that she's physically mature enough, not just sexually mature enough, um, if you're looking at breeding. And also her body condition score. So we definitely think of um, a mare being too skinny to breed. She's not going to be able to maintain that pregnancy. But also a mare that's really vastly overweight is going to have a lot lower conception rates. So if, especially if you're paying for a breeding, then it's kind of counterproductive if she's so overweight that you're having really low conception rates or that you're having to try more than one time to um, get her pregnant, you're also losing time. So and um, birthday can be important depending on what you're breeding for. So trying to make sure she's kind of in that middle of a good body condition score, maybe a little bit on the um, heavier side because she is going to have to maintain that pregnancy, but also not overweight so that she's going to have problems getting pregnant. So stallions is pretty similar. Um, the actual physical part of the breeding soundness exam is going to consist um, very, or a lot more rarely, um, internally mostly, the breeding sinus exam is going to focus on their external genitalia and then also his libido and his semen quality. So they're going to take a semen sample and look at it to make sure that um, one, he has a good sperm count and two, that um, his sperm are um, mobile, that they're able to move and also that they're formed correctly to be able to get them through the mare's reproductive tract. And then libido, some stallions just aren't super interested in the mares and it can be hard to breed a stallion that doesn't really want to breed. So all of those are going to be kind of the physical part of 
of reading a sound, soundness exam along with the lameness, um, with stallions, maybe even more so to a point than mares because they're going to have to physically mount the mare if you're trying to do live cover and in a lot of artificial insemination scenarios um, when the stallion goes to be collected, he's going to mount a phantom. So once um, he's lame or when, if he has continuing lameness issues, that makes it a lot harder and kind of opens up, you, gotta, you have to look for other options. Um, also his history. So if he's not um, been able to have high conception rates, if his foals haven't been that great, um, all of this is stuff to look for um, in his history when you're looking at his paperwork. So this can continue to grow and change over time, just like a mare's can as she gets older. But his too, as you're looking at his offspring, it's not just um, the dam actually, especially here, we tend to place um, a lot of emphasis on the sire. In the United States, other countries tend to place more emphasis on the dam. Um, but in the United States, we place a lot of emphasis on the sire and what the sire's other offspring has done and what the sire's history and genealogy is. So his history can be pretty important when you're considering um, breeding a stallion. His confirmation, because that passes along as well. And then his attitude. Um, I think a lot of people assume that stallions are just always nasty. They don't have to be. Um, I've seen stallions that are really, really good. I've seen stallions that are really, really not so good. Um, attitude wise. So part of that is to take into consideration if you have a hateful mare, do you really want to breed her to a hateful stallion? Um, because believe it or not, some of that, it's not one of those like highly inheritable traits, but some of that can be passed on. And it's also, also enters into a danger thing. Do you really want to keep um, dealing with a stallion that has a bad attitude can be dangerous because at the end of the day, they're still a lot bigger than we are. So when you're looking at selecting a sire, um, a lot of it depends on breed. So different breeds are obviously going to look for different traits and they're going to place certain values over others when you're looking at what you want in a foal. Um, but a lot of it will always come down to genetics. So a lot of it will be name, who's in their pedigree, who do they have that has done really well in the past somewhere along their pedigree. Um, but a lot of it is also going to be genetic conditions. So if you're doing quarter horses, which are pretty popular, especially in this part of the United States, um, one of the big things is looking at a five panel. So this is some of the um, genetic conditions that are really prevalent in the quarter horse breed or related breeds. And it's stuff like HYPP and HERDA and PSSM. Um, so stuff that once it gets into a bloodline, can be really hard to manage, especially, um, especially with HYPP. I think this one everyone kind of has heard about or knows about um, because it's not always bred away from us. Like some of these things, if the horse gets one dose of this gene, then it can make them an attractive horse. But if they get two doses of the gene, it's fatal. So it hasn't always been bred away from. So, and that goes for any breeds, like all breeds have certain genetic stuff that you can look for and test for. But if you have the genetic history of the sire and the dam, then you're able to kind of piece together what's a safe breeding and what's not. So then it becomes up to you if you know that there's a possibility, if both parents have a positive gene, then is it a, you know, a one in four chance that you're going to end up with a foal with a very serious or um, possibly 100% fatal condition. And at the end of the day, like if you're paying high money to breed, um, a one in four chance of having a foal that's never going to survive to adulthood um, can be pretty significant. Color, so color can go two ways actually. Um, if you have the some of the coat color genetics, then you can actually do some fancy math and kind of figure out the probabilities of what color foal you can have if you're breeding for a specific thing. Um, in our last breeding season, when I was at Tech, they bred a mare and they wanted a foal, uh, they wanted a Napaloosa foal, so they found a sire and went through and found out, um, found a sire until they had one that they knew would 100% give them a spotted baby. Um, 
and then went through and did the different probabilities of like what color spots the baby was going to have and that kind of thing. So if you have that information available, it's not super hard. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to go through and add up what your possibilities are, but you can, if you have that information, breed for a specific color. Um, but also in some cases, it's something to be wary of. So if you have a paint and you're trying to breed to a paint, if they're both Overo's, then there's something called um, lethal white Overo syndrome. And it's where the foals intestinal tract doesn't form. So breeding two Overo's together isn't, you know, always a desirable thing because it can lead to that lethal white syndrome. So even stuff like that is stuff to consider um, before you make a breeding. And then also it can increase the foals value. So like I said, a lot of it is named who along this thyers or this dam's pedigree um, performed really well for the expectations that you're wanting out of that foal. So just trying to get a little bit of basic um, genetic information or pedigree from um, a potential sire um, can really help you out in the long run, just as far as getting a foal that you're going to be able to use or sell, whatever your purpose is, and then getting a foal that's going to actually really perform well. So another thing is cost. Um, just realistically, it's easy to want the best sire out there, um, but stud fees get expensive. So like before you start breeding, it's a good idea to sit down and think of what are your expenses going to be as far as care for the mare all the way through gestation um, and foaling, and then also what are you willing to pay for a stud fee. So once you kind of figure that out, then you can kind of keep in your price range and look for those key points to pull out. Um, and it's a give and take thing. So something, if one trait or characteristic is really high on your list, you might have to sacrifice um, another one a little bit along down the line to kind of keep it within that cost level. It really just depends. Um, the size of the mare and stallion. So mares, um, foaling, if it's difficult, can be really dangerous for the mare or the foal, either one or both in some cases. Um, so one of just the basic things is the size if you're trying to breed a really small mare to a really large stallion. And then obviously that's going to cause um, cause some problems. And there are things, and I'll talk into some of the reproductive technologies and stuff in a few minutes. Um, there are things to get around that, but you just have to be conscientious of um, looking for it and saying this might be a problem later on. And also the purpose of the foal. So if you're looking for um, a Western horse or stock horse, then maybe you're looking more toward a traditional like quarter horse type or um, one of those stockier horses versus one of the, a really lean horse that you would see in um, jumping or eventing or the hunters, something like that. So it might be a really, really nice stallion, but if he doesn't meet the type that you're wanting that foal to meet, then the breeding isn't going to work. You're going to get a foal that's not going to fulfill the purpose that you wanted to. Um, and time of year doesn't really go with selecting a sire per se, but it's something to be thinking about as you're looking at this um, first selection process of trying to create the mating that you're wanting. Um, especially if you intend to register or compete with the horse, a lot of breed registries have universal birthdays and that's always going to be January 1st. So that means it doesn't matter if a foal is born January 1st or a July 1st or whatever time of the year, their birthday is going to be considered January 1st. So when that rolls around, they're gonna be a one-year-old. They're gonna um, be considered a yearling by the breed registry, even though they might not be. So in those cases, you're going to want a foal born as close to January 1st as possible especially if you're competing because it gives you that competitive advantage once you get into classes and things like that. So mares are long day breeders, which means that they don't come, they don't start cycling until the days get longer. So their peak, um, their peak fertile period is actually on up in the year a little bit, kind of around June. Um, but once again, mares have an 11 month gestation. So if you're not breeding until June or July, then you're not getting that foal until almost halfway through the year. So you're losing almost six months versus a foal that was born earlier in the year. Um, so that can be manipulated. They make light masks to kind of manipulate the photo period 
to trick the brain into thinking that the days are longer than they actually are and to have her cycling earlier. Um, you can put lights in her stalls, things like that, time it out. Um, anything to kind of fool the mare's brain into thinking that the days are longer that is for, excuse me, farther along in the year and she'll start cycling regularly um, earlier on and you can go ahead and get her bread. You just have to weigh the costs of then when she folds, you know it's going to be fairly cold outside. Um, and you're going to have to deal with that. She's going to have to deal with that. And also it's just, it depends on when you have the time. So a lot of people um, will still fold out in the summer because they have a little bit of extra time in the summer. So it really depends on what works best for you and what you want, but that's just something to be aware of that if you're looking to compete with a horse, that breed registries, um, for the most part, will recognize a universal birthday as January 1st. So now we're gonna actually get into some of the breeding methods. Um, the first one is just going to be live cover because it's simple, that's letting the stallion actually come into physical contact with the mare and breed her himself. And some breed organizations actually require it. So thoroughbreds are a big one. Um, um, they're actually required to breed live cover if that foal is going to be registered. And one of the big reasons is this assures the identity of the sire. Um, it kind of makes sure that the sire you want is the sire you get and the baby that you want has the DNA that you wanted to have. So it just makes it a little more um, a little more sure. You do have higher conception rates um, than you do with some of the AI techniques. And it also kind of preserves that diversity within the gene. So a stallion can only breed so many mares physically in a year. And that's actually one of, can be one of the cons if you're looking as far as monetarily goes. Um, that, that stallion only has a breeding season that's so long. He's only going to breed so many mares during that season. So that can increase his stud fee um, because that means that his breeding capabilities are a little less, but it also means that he's going to get a lot fewer breedings in than what could be possible if you are collecting his semen. Um, it also kind of provides some dangers to the horses and the humans. They're just coming into contact. Um, and anytime you're in that environment with a mare and a stallion, it can be a little unpredictable. Um, something can always go wrong, whether you're doing live cover or AI, but I think this one is probably a little more dangerous because you're just adding another animal into that mix. So it's something to be careful of. Um, and you also have to look, if you're trying to breed to an expensive stallion or if you have a really nice mare, um, there are risks involved. If the stallion bites her or blemishes her, then if you're trying to show her in a class where they take off points for that, then it's a calculated risk you're going to have to take on whether you want that stallion to have the ability to get that close to her or not. So just the live co cover process usually begins with teasing. Um, so that's just bringing the mare into contact with the stallion across usually across some kind of barrier in some kind of controlled environment. So this isn't a place where you're going to let the stallion actually mount the mare, but this is just more of a heat detection to make sure she's actually in estrus or in heat. So it kind of eliminates a little bit of the risk if you know beforehand that this mare is going to be receptive to the stallion and also means that you're going to not waste a breeding. Um, so you have a much higher conception rate if you're teasing beforehand. So any signs of aggression toward the stallion means that the mare pretty much isn't ready. She's not, um, she's not an estrus. She can kick. She's going to um, lay her ears back. She's going to try to get away from the stallion. She's going to try to kick the stallion. All those kind of negative feedback signs are signs saying that she doesn't want anything to do with him. Um, if you watch her and you see winking of her vulva, if she's squatting, if she's urinating, that signs that she's in estrus. That signs that she's going to be receptive to the stallion, let her mount. Um, I put always tease over a sturdy fence or a stall door. That doesn't actually happen in real life. This is my personal two cents. Um, and it does happen a good deal of the time where it's um, either one stallion and one mare in a controlled environment or a stallion um, maybe going down an aisle if you're doing several mares. Um, people do tease in herds or tease in a pasture, you just have to be careful. I think 
especially for the humans involved that can create a lot of risk really quickly, especially if the mare isn't receptive to the stallion. Um, once she starts kicking and biting at him, then you can kind of get yourself in the center of it. I've seen or heard of people um, bringing a stallion in to a herd of mares and trying to have him um, heat test all of the mares in that field at one time. And I think putting putting yourself and the stallion and the mares in that situation can kind of set you up to escalate pretty quickly. So I would, personally, I would always suggest that if you're trying to um, tease or heat test a mare, that you're doing it with some kind of barrier in between the mare and the stallion. That also ensures that he's not going to try to mount before you're ready for him to actually mount the mare. So if you're pasture breeding um, after and not everyone teases before they pasture breed a lot. Some people um, will just turn the stallion out and that's okay too. Um, but if you tease, you kind of have a better idea of, okay, um, she's going to be receptive. It lowers the chance of injury to the, both the mare and the stallion. And it kind of ensures a little bit of a better pregnancy, right? Um, but if you're doing that, just be observant for injuries because you're just kind of putting them out there together. It's a little bit less of a control environment. So just observe both of them and make sure they don't come back with any kind of serious injuries. There might be like nicks and cuts, but you want to watch for lamenesses. You want to watch for serious kicks, things like that. And maybe one of the other kind of cons is that it can kind of obscure your due dates. Um, so this, especially if you're um, trying to be careful of when your mare is foaling, this can kind of create a little bit of problems. You're going to have to be a lot more on top of things when it comes closer to time for her to fall, to be able to watch and know when to bring her in. So it's just gonna be watching for signs a little bit more later on down the road. Hand breeding, um, this brings in a little bit more risk back onto the handlers. Um, and if you see in this picture, um, the attendants are wearing helmets, that's really pretty standard and pretty common. Um, wearing a thick vest and then the mare is also outfitted with this kind of protective um, she has a hood over her neck and that's just to kind of help with biting if the stallion tries to bite at her neck or the top of her withers then he's all he's going to bite is it's a really thick piece of leather so he's not actually going to get to her to hurt her or to cause something that's going to be a permanent blemish on her um, neck or withers and she's also outfitted with these boots. Um, so that's to protect the stallion. So when he mounts her, it's kind of a very vulnerable position if she decides um, that she's not ready to be bred and she kicks out at him, then it can cause injuries pretty quickly. So these boots, um, if she kicks him, are going to really reduce the impact that she can have as far as hurting the an probably expensive stallion. Um, so the handlers and the mare are both kind of given this protective equipment beforehand to try to mitigate any risks that come with the live cover breeding. And then going away from live cover into artificial insemination, a lot of breeders actually prefer this. It's really, really common in quarter horses, um, especially they don't do a whole lot of live cover because the breed organizations allow um, AI foals to be registered. So one of the biggest pros is that it's safer. Um, when the mayor's not coming in contact with the stallion, it allows you to control that environment with one more thing. So you're one more barrier in between the stallion and the mare, and you're dealing with one horse at a time. So it's a little bit more controlled. It also allows breedings with stallions that would otherwise be impossible. Um, so sometimes it's not feasible to travel to either meet the sire or if the sire is traveling um especially some like high dollar horses will travel to other countries or things like that to breed um it kind of eliminates some of that spatial problems that you would have if you were trying to breed live cover and it also increases the breeding capabilities of the stallion so a stallion can breed once again a stallion breeding live cover only can take so many mares in a breeding season but you can take a single ejaculate and make several doses of semen to ship out and breed mares. So they're having a much greater chance of breeding more mares. They can also be collected um, in times that a mare, you wouldn't normally breed a mare because that semen can be frozen and stored. 
So it just means that that stallion can sire a lot more offspring. Um, the cons is this negative effect on genet genetic diversity. It doesn't have to happen, but unfortunately it does. And that's, this is what leads to um, a lot of genetic disorders later on down the line is that if you have a really good stallion, you're trying to use him a lot to, because he's got good offspring. He has traits that he passes on to a lot of his offspring. Um, his offspring are good performers. And so everyone wants a foal by the stallion. And you get within this breed, so many mares that have sired foals by the stallion that it really reduces the genetics in that breed to a few of the really, really good sires until you're going to start having inbreeding problems down the line. So HYPP, um, I think everyone knows, like Impressive was kind of that foundation sire for the HYPP gene. Um, and he sired, he was a really, really good horse. He sired a lot of foals, but now because he sires so many foals, it's kind of become ingrained into the quarter horse um, gene pool that we have so many foals um, or so many horses with this gene that we now have to test for it. So also pedigrees can be questioned. Um, most of the time, especially if you're buying um, semen from a reputable company, or a reputable breeder, um, and then they're going to do 100% everything in their power to ensure that the semen you're buying is from the horse that you want it to be from. But it just raises one more question of you're not, your nine chances out of 10 are not going to see this stallion collected before it's shipped to you. Um, so obviously you can do DNA on the foal and stuff like that, but that's a step no one really wants to take. Um, but it just raises that question, and that's one reason why some breed organizations go away from AI, um, is because it just is one more thing you can bring into question. Now, I don't think that necessarily happens a lot, but the possibility is obviously out there. Another con is decreased conception rate, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in a second, but anytime you're trying to keep sperm alive for an extended period of time, it kind of decreases your chance of having a pregnancy. So it's just, it depends on what you want and how, um, how intensive you want to be with your breeding as to what option works best for you as far as AI or live cover goes. So just a little bit more, um, I guess, technique about the artificial insemination. So to collect the semen, um, the stallion is going to be brought into contact with the um, teaser mare to get him ready. And most of the time what's going to happen is he's going to mount a phantom to be for um, the staff to collect him. Um, the, he can be ground collected. So stallions can be collected on the ground. And this comes into if you have a really good stallion but has, he um, has an injury that has caused lameness issues. So it's not a genetic lameness that he's going to pass down to his offspring. It's something that happened physically. It was an accident or something like that. Um, and it doesn't allow him to mount a mare, to mount a phantom. This is a way that he can still breed and you can breed um, or you can collect him on the ground. But that's not something that is always super desirable um, just because it's a little harder on everyone. And in my opinion, I think it's probably a little more dangerous than having him mount a phantom. So you have several options. You can use fresh semen, so you can collect a stallion and then use it right then and there with the mare. Um, and that's really only if you just want to keep that mare and that stallion out of contact with each other. Um, they can cool semen, so that can't be stored for an extended period of time. So normally that's used within a couple of days. So it's collected, it's cooled, it's shipped, and then the mare is bred with it. It doesn't have an extended life, but it does have a little bit of a higher conception rate than a frozen semen. So frozen semen can be stored, excuse me, frozen semen can be stored indefinitely in liquid nitrogen um, and is frozen in these like straws and placed in these big containers and these containers have liquid nitrogen in them and they can be stored for years and years and years. Um, the problem is that it's not a good option for all stallions. You can have a really, really good stallion that just does not freeze well. Um, and I think it's something like 30% of stallions are like re really good, you know, freezers. Their sperm stays really, excuse me, really alive. Um, and you're going to have really high conception rates. 
and you're going to have 30% that just you are not going to get a full out of them if you try to freeze them. Um, and then that other 40% is kind of in the middle. So you just have to be prepared that um, you might not get a pregnancy the first time all the time with frozen semen, especially if it's a stallion who hasn't really been collected before that um, it's going to be a little bit of trial and error until you find whether or not that semen is going to freeze really well. So it's just something to be aware of, but it's pretty cool because they've, um, they've gotten foals out of stallions that have been dead for quite some time. And it's just, uh, it's another technology that allows you to kind of keep the good genes and be able to pass them down. So other options, and these can kind of be used in conjunction with the other two, but this is some of the other like scientific options that have become um, more common. And one of them is in vitro fertilization or ICSI. So they're basically different techniques of the same thing where um, the egg is fertilized outside of the mare. So you collect an um, unfertilized egg from the mare, you collect sperm from the stallion, and the fertilization happens in the mare before that fertilized egg is implanted back into a mare. Um, so in vitro basically is done in a petri dish and then this ICSI, this is what this is down here and it's basically done microscopically um, where they take this sperm and actually um, inject it into an egg. So it's like a physical um, penetration to make, make sure that fertilization happens. Um, and then they can ensure fertilization before they implant that um, fertilized egg back into a mare. Embryo transfer allows you to get more than one foal from a mare if that's what you want. It has a lot of uses. Um, also, if once again, going back to size of a mare versus size of the stallion, um, if you have a large stallion bred to a small mare, maybe it was a genetic decision, but one of your options is to flush that embryo out of that mare and then put it into a mare that can handle the pregnancy. If you have a really good mare, but she's just, she always has, um, dystocia problems where she's not able to foal out really well, then that's another one of your options. You can still breed her and get foals from her. You just flush the embryos and implant it into a mare that's able to carry that pregnancy well. Another option I saw um, a couple years ago is twins. So twins normally really mean bad news in mares, um, in case you didn't know. Um, they normally don't survive. If you're trying to have twins, um, kind of your best case scenario is that one of them is going to die. They, there are cases where mares have successfully had twins. It just unfortunately doesn't usually end that way and it can end with the death of all three. Um, so normally what happens is once you find out you have twins, the vet is going to pick the weaker one of the two and go ahead and abort that one and the mare will carry um, the live foal and the dead foal both to term and then deliver the foal and then deliver the really small dead, um, we call it like a dummy foal or a mummy foal. Um, and so that's what normally happens, but we had a mare at Tech that every year you bred her just about, she'd throw twins. She did, I think, three times in a row. And last year, they flushed one of the embryos and implanted that embryo into another mare. And so we actually were able to keep both twins. Um, and that way it just, um, it gave us an extra horse and didn't have to um, eliminate the one embryo. So it was a really neat, um, neat way to kind of preserve that extra foal. Because if you're able to get two foals out of one breeding, then this is a way to kind of preserve that. So I'm going to, just a little bit of care during um, pregnancy of the mare. You can pregnancy check around two weeks post breeding and that's about as early as you're going to get a confirmed pregnancy. Sometimes it may take a little bit longer, um, but a vet can ultrasound around two weeks and probably get you a yes, she's bred, no, she's not. And then day 45 is about the earliest that you're going to be able to sex that um, foal. So, and then sometimes also that can take up to two months. But if you're interested in knowing the sex of your foal beforehand, that can happen sometimes as early as day 45. And there's technology now about um, working with sex semen, so you know beforehand what you get and things like that. I don't think that's um, necessarily like widely or commercially used by any means, but the research is being done into it. So 
but right now it's mostly um, a, about two months into the pregnancy, then you can identify the sex of the foal. Nutritionally, and I know I talked about if you were um, here for the nutrition presentation, I talked a little bit about um, what that looks like for a gestating mare. And basically her protein requirements are really going to start increasing in the last trimester and they're going to peak right before pregnancy because that's when she's really putting a lot of effort into um, forming the muscles of that foal and the bones of that foal. Um, so her last trimester is going to be really needy as far as protein goes and then also her energy requirements are going to start going up and her energy requirements are actually going to stay really high all the way through lactation. So the entire time that foal is nursing, her energy requirements are going to stay high. Her protein requirements are going to peak right before she foals and then slowly start going down um, through her lactation. And then I just said, be cautious when pasturing pregnant mares, especially here, a lot of pasture. Um, Virginia, most of our grass is fescue. We have a ton of fescue. Um, and fescue toxicosis is a real, um, can be a real problem. So just be cautious when, if you're pasturing them, um, it can cause a lot of birthing problems. Um, it can really um, increase the size of the membranes. It can make it hard on the foal. It affects their hoof development, their hair development, like everything you can think of. Um, it can affect in some way or the other. It can cause um, a lot of foals that unfortunately just don't make it. So just be cautious because a lot of the grass around here is fescue um, and not all fescue is going to cause these symptoms. Um, it's the endophyte infested fescue um, and you can actually test for it. Um, a lot of mares are either brought in during the late stages of their pregnancy or maybe put on a dry lot and fed a different kind of hay that doesn't have any fescue in it but it's just something to be aware of, like I said, because we have so much fescue in this area. Um, deworming, vaccination, all of this is going to occur before the foal is born. So you're going to deworm within that month period before the foal is born, and they usually will worm again um, around the time the foal is born. And then you're also going to vaccinate, so you want to get um, her core, the foal's core vaccines in, um, just because it gets the immunity from its mom at birth. So you're going to want to get those core vaccines in. Um, and most of them are just a one-time thing except for Rhino. And Rhino is a series, I think, of three. So she's going to get three different booster or a Rhino shot and then two boosters throughout her pregnancy to pass that immunity along when the foal is born. Um, foaling prep, um, just the signs that the mare is about to foal. So about four to six weeks before foaling, you're going to see her udder become a lot visibly fuller. Um, so she starts kind of bagging up, and you can see that. And that's a really good sign that she's starting, um, kind of starting that process um, of getting close to foaling. And then waxing. So basically what happens is they'll start um, kind of leaking a little bit of colostrum, and it's going to wax up in their teats. Um, and this is going to happen within like one or two days of foaling. So if you're seeing waxing in her teats, then you know that she's really close to foaling. Also, her milk calcium is going to go up. Um, and this is something that requires tests to per requires you to purchase the tests for. I think they're relatively inexpensive. Um, and this is really only if you have like a problem there or you don't really know, or if it's really important to you to kind of observe um, and be really cautious about when she is going to fall. So that is an option that you can do. Um, you can test her milk calcium levels and that just requires a little bit of um, milk. So you just have to um, get a little bit of milk each day and then test her calcium levels. Um, her full length stall should be quiet. Um, try to get it in an area where she's not going to have a lot of disturbance because that can affect um, how she folds. And then the best bedding to use is just a really thick layer of straw. So, and then ideally, she should be under constant observation once she's brought in. So, if you're bringing her in and thinking, okay, she's going to fold in the next two or three days, then ideally you should be able to watch her, whether that's through a camera system or not. That doesn't always happen, unfortunately. Um, sometimes it's just not feasible to put that much time into it. But it's one of those things, if you have a camera system, you can rig up or something like that and put, put it, excuse me, um, hook it into your phone, then um, it's a way you can kind of keep an eye on her without having to constantly go in and check on her. It kind of gives her her space and privacy and kind of 
um, make her a little bit more comfortable, but still lets you observe her. And then foaling. Um, so mares go through three stages um, during foaling. And the first one is just her initial uterine contractions and the positioning of the foal. Um, it lasts like four hours. So foaling um, is pretty quick. It doesn't last super long compared to some of the other species. Um, and it's just going to be, she's going to become restless. She's going to pace. She's going to paw, like lie down and get up. Um, so all of these are signs like she's uncomfortable and she's getting ready to foal. Um, stage two is just the actual delivery of the foal, and this should not last more than like half an hour. Um, so it's going to begin, you'll see her water break, and then within half an hour, you should have a foal on the ground. If not, that's the time to call the vet because something is probably wrong. Um, your foal should present with its front feet first, usually they're a little offset, and then the head between the knees. Um, and so if it's mispositioned, then that can be a reason why um, the mare can be having trouble giving birth. And then stage three is delivery of the placenta, and this also should not last more than um, three or four hours, um, just because if she retains the placenta, it can cause a lot of infection. So it's important a lot of times, um, it won't, she won't completely expel it all at once, um, but don't try to just take it and pull it out, um, because if you rip it, she's going to retain part of that placenta, and like I said, that can cause infection, um, and it can be really life-threatening to the mare. And so after foaling, um, you want the foal standing and nursing within a couple of hours at most. It needs the colostrum, and if the foal isn't able to actually get up, then something is probably wrong. Um, and that's also a time to call the vet. So try to um, observe and try to know when your mare is foaling, and then just watch for a couple of hours to make sure that the foal is getting everything that it needs. Um, and then if possible, um, try to take the, once your mare passes the placenta, try to take it and examine it. Um, you should have both horns of the uterus, the body of the uterus, um, and then the umbilical cord. So you should have the whole thing if you're obviously missing pieces of it. Um, and then that's also a time to call the vet and make sure that um, she isn't going to retain part of that placenta. So that's it. And like I said, I know that was a really quick overview. Um, but is there any questions? Okay. Well, Great job, Emily. Yeah, I thank y'all. I hope you all have a good night.